Excellent. Hello, everyone. How was the conference? Is the last day? Is the last day? <laughs> Good. I hope you learned something. I hope you had fun. Okay, and well done for sticking till the end. Three things about me. My name is Leah. I'm a software engineer, and I work at FundUps for the last five years, a rag tech company based in London. I was here in May um, in Porto. It was a beautiful weather, not like the one we had this time. And I highly recommend Guandales Football Club Bar. It has a beautiful view over the bridge, especially at the sunset. Chi beer. I think it's not too bad at the moment, so maybe you can go for a pint after this talk. At the time, Dylan Beatty, you had the pleasure of hearing his talk, I think, twice this conference. He convinced me to speak at the London.net user group meetup. Um, he said that people at the meetup are great and that they are never going to tell a lie and hurt you. I was like, OK, that's awkward, but fine. <laughs> that meetup is a place where it brings people together, software engineers, developers, to talk about .NET, about newest tricks and tri tips, and to learn what's new, to share ideas. It's a great, great meetup. Next time when you're in London, make sure to check it out. Just before that talk, I was here. Uh, and actually, this is a photo from the meetup. I do have other clothes in my wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as I was saying, uh, that meetup was my first opportunity to speak outside fund-ups and in front of people that I don't know. And just before it, I was right here in Porto. What a beautiful coincidence. Majority of this talk was actually written right here in Porto. And I'm going to present it to you today, first time speaking at the conference. <laughs> I hope you find it interesting. I hope you find it motivating. I hope it sparks conversations. And I hope it invokes a sense of urgency. Cool, enough of a break, uh, icebreaker mostly to calm my nerves. Today, I'm going to share with you the story, the journey we in FundUps, thank you very much. <laughs> Today, I'm going to share a journey we in FundUps took to build a more sustainable future for our business and as a B Corp for the environment. Show of hands, how many of you know what B Corp is or have heard? Oh, that's quite a few. Let me repeat it for the people that don't know it. B Corps are companies verified by B Lab to meet high standards of social, environmental performance, transparency, and accountability. We started with the monolith application running in a single process, self-hosted architecture. And we re architected it into cloud-native distributed architecture in AWS. We have been on this journey for four years. And today, I'm going to share what challenges we were having, why we did it, and how we went after them. But before I'm able to do that, I think it's important for you to know who we are, what we do, and to use that to frame your thinking. FundUps provides compliance as a service to investment management industry. Our main product is shareholding disclosure. To simplify it, what that means is that investment institutions, in, when they cross a certain threshold of owning an investment, they need to disclose it, hence why shareholding disclosure. So let's say I own 5% of Google shares. I buy it. First of all, I probably wouldn't be here. I would be sipping pina colada somewhere on a beach. But when I return to the real world and stop daydreaming, in the real world, owning such a massive chunk of a company like Google comes with responsibilities. I can't just keep it a secret and secretly pile my empire of Google shares. So I need to disclose it to the world through the regulators. Hey, I own 5% of Google. It's not just a courtesy call, it's the law. The penalty for not complying is very costly and it can damage companies' reputation. In some countries, people can end up in jail. It's not easy to keep an eye on the regulation, as it's different in every country, 
It changes very often, sometimes on a daily basis, and it can be triggered for different conditions. Let's say if a company goes on a takeover panel. Deadlines are sometimes even on the same day. So instead of every company having a team of regulatory experts and developers that monitor these regulations and then monitor the changes, why not just do it once? We know the power of third-party tools in software engineering, right? Reducing maintenance burden, time and cost savings, the power of community and support. FundUps provides to the investment institutions exactly that, outsourcing the process of knowing when they need to disclose. We monitor over 15% of global assets under management for shareholding for 130 of our clients, which is over 17 trillion US dollars. We were founded in 2010, which means we have been around for a while. And what's important for today's story is that we have been bootstrapped. That means we did not have injections of money to rebuild things from the ground up. It made us very lean and tactical, especially at early, at early stages of our growth. OK. Our mission is to make compliance simple through automation and community. Our clients will provide a full set of their positions on a daily basis through UI or API in the form of XML. At the heart of what we do is a very complex, bespoke rule engine that we use to model the regulation. The rule engine will, use those will take those positions, it will validate them, it will enrich them with data we collect from different sources. And then it will perform analysis over them. It will run a set of regulatory rules over the complete set of data, generate some results, and store them. We get the regulation from a law firm, and then our in-house team of regulatory experts analyzes it and transforms it into code that all, of our that all of our clients use. So when our clients get these results, they'll continue with their daily workflows. They might discuss it internally, or they might generate documents that they need that they'll, that they'll use to put to the regulators. In order to better explain the challenges we were facing, let's dig deeper into this rule engine. I mentioned that the clients are going to be providing us every day with a set of the full set of their positions in the form of XML. But what does that mean? Every oh, sorry for the quality. Every position will have a set of properties attached to it. Let's say, for example, ID, price currency, total shares outstanding, quantity. This number, that's how many shares you would need to buy of Google to own 5%. And then if you multiply it by the price, yeah, a big number. <laughs> exactly. So every one of those positions belongs to a group. We call it a portfolio. That group. Um, represent a legal structure on our client side, a legal entity. It can be an individual investor, like me, or it can be an investment manager, like Kate, that works at the company and that is responsible for a set of investments. That's what the client will provide in their position file. The rule engine will then take those positions. It will validate them. And then it will calculate some additional properties that we will use in the later steps. Like you can see their price in euro. The rule engine will then take those enriched positions. It will calculate rules over each one of those portfolios. So in this case, over my portfolio and over Kate's portfolio. It will generate some results and store them to the database. Each of these steps validate plan, calculate the properties, and then calculate the rules over each one of those portfolios by generating the results stored into the database. They need to happen in sequence. 
but the individual calculations within those steps, like running a single rule over Kate's portfolio, those, uh, those can happen in parallel. So, in practice, to give you some sense of numbers, our clients can have tens of millions of positions. Each one of those positions can have over 100 properties attached to it. Every one of those positions is then subdivided into portfolios. And due to complex structures of our clients, some of them have 50,000 portfolios. The rule engine will then run a set of regulatory rules over them. We support 100 jurisdictions, over 500 rules. When you combine all of that, we're talking of an order of tens of millions individual calculations. And I'm not talking about adding two numbers. You're talking about individual calculations that are potentially running over millions of positions. What's also important here is a time frame. When our clients give us their positions, they want the results immediately, because some of those deadlines are on the same day. So it doesn't leave us or them with much wiggle room. For majority of our clients, that is nowadays five minutes to 15 minutes. But for some of our complex clients, we committed to under 60 minutes which has been a challenge at some stages. OK, it's time to dig deeper why that was a challenge. When FundApps was started, we developed the rule engine with technology available in 2010. What will not come as a surprise is that we built the monolith. We had a small farm of relatively large Windows boxes that were doing the work, that were running the rule engine. The storage was SQL Server, and yet again, hosted on another set of relatively chunky Windows boxes. Our clients run files usually once a day, and that's during the week when the markets are open, which means that these sizable Windows boxes are just sitting around and idling. They're horribly underutilized, with somewhere around like 20% of utilization. That's just a waste of money. But we needed to keep these Windows boxes always on and over provision to, co to support the, those peaks of time where our clients need to run their files so we wouldn't impact their run times. As I said, very expensive. And in some cases, let me tell you, we couldn't support those workloads. Even with the biggest Windows machines AWS provided, which is one terabyte. And I don't even need to tell you how pricey that is and that it's not profitable at all. We did lose that client. Additionally, the rule engine generates a lot of data, which made our storage grow rapidly and it started causing backup issues. To put it a little bit in perspective, on daily, on the worst days, we would generate around 300 gigabytes of data. And across all of our client base, we had around 100 terabytes of data stored on primary instances. With backups and replicas, that's around 400 terabytes. That's a little bit much for SQL Server. And with all of these always on and over-provisioned instances, self-hosted infrastructure. We need to all do all of that with patch management, drifting configurations. We can work. We basically had a maintenance nightmare. OK, so to use those over-provisioned, underutilized instances, right from the start, we share them between the clients. That saved some energy. That saved some money but it didn't come without no consequences. We started having more support issues, client impacting each other, noisy neighboring. And the computational power was not the only thing that clients shared. This over-provisioned SQL server 
fit exactly the same profile. Sharing computational power and storage power with onboarding more larger clients and more complex clients, our st clients are starting to notice longer runtimes, inconsistent runtimes, unpredictable, and even computational file failures without even generating any results. And in turn, we spend a lot of time firefighting, trying to support the engine that we knew it has its own limitations. We're trying to optimize something that it really didn't make sense, that it didn't have future. With these challenges and this infrastructure, it will make it very expensive to support any larger and any more complex clients. And we were worried that we would not be able to support them, which would be commercially dangerous. And that made the rule engine become a very serious business growth and sales barrier. This was us in our old office in Shoreditch before the pandemic. Yes, exactly like that. Our phones would start ringing. Slack would overflow with errors. We would all sit around one or two laptops. Yeah, exactly like that. And we would start investigating. We knew immediately that you know, we couldn't do much without any serious work. And soon, we would discover it was one of the few things. Either we put one too many clients on the same Windows box, or it was 10 a.m. Monday, our clients are starting to upload files, and weekend backups have not finished yet. The database is on fire. Or that the new client that we just signed up is a little bit bigger than the rule engine can handle. You get the picture. Usually, the money was to throw, the solution was to throw more money at it, give it more power, give it more CPU, because anything else was just needed a lot of engineering time. Our cost of maintenance was rising rapidly, and it was higher than any engineering team, any business would like. And we had a sales barrier. We could not sell anymore. Finally, we made a decision, a big and scary one, back in 2019 to rebuild the engine from the ground up. In order to be there for our clients long term, we needed to make this massive investment, both in terms of money and time. And maybe not a lot of companies would have done the same, but one of our company's values is have courage. So we went for it. This is what we came up with. This was our North Star, cloud native and share nothing. We were already big on AWS, and we decided to use as many managed services as we can that would allow us to focus on resolving business challenges and resolving our clients' challenges. And leave it to AWS to manage backups, to do patching, to do scaling, to scale up the servers. Do all of that undifferentiated work that it, it really doesn't matter in which industry you are in. They can do the heavy lifting, and they were good at it. So we designed our systems to horizontally scale computation that got us benefit of work at stream scale. And when it comes to storage, we just had a couple of columns that did not fit the monolithic relational database, but that were using a lot of space. Think JSON blobs, big JSON blobs of compressed data. So we made sure we used different database solutions, different storage solutions, that fit the data better, that fit the problem we were trying to solve. And by splitting the data, by making sure we are not using infrastructure between our clients, between the components, we simplified our operations. We also gain greater visibility and greater security. Let me give you an example, a simple one, but something that really made a difference. When it comes to security, our principle is the one of least privilege. When we had all of the data in the SQL cluster, of course, you can't give anyone access to that except a couple of people, which means we can't access our demo data. When it's something happens to a client that is not even confidential data, we can't even see it. 
So by splitting this out and using different storage that have different and finer permission levels, we can now see our demo data because it's in different account. We can actually see our client data that is not confidential and that can help us diagnose either the problem or an improvement. What we are going to be talking about today is what we have done to migrate 130 of our clients to the new architecture, clients of different shape and size, with all of the feature our old code base, our old platform supported. We started this journey four years ago. We moved our first client on the new architecture 20 months ago, and we finished the migration at the beginning of August. I'm not going to go in depth in any particular technology or concept, but I'm going to show you a design principle we use to solve for our challenges. Before I do that, I'll introduce some of the AWS components we used. How many of you are familiar with AWS? Okay, let's quickly go through them. Step functions. We use them to orchestrate the work. They're basically kind of building the workflows, connecting the pieces. SQS, simple messaging system, simple queuing system for messages, for distributing the work, for fanning out. S3 is Amazon's file storage. We use it for two purposes. One is as a temporary storage between those steps in the workflows, and the other one is long-term storage. Remember those JSON blobs? Yeah. DynamoDB is a document store. Again, two purposes. It's kind of like a metadata to all of those files in S3, and it's uses also to track all of the work we are distributing to know when we are done. Lambdas, simple computation. Let me give you an example. Step functions didn't know how to add two numbers or kind of go in a loop. So one of our lambdas is adding two numbers. Those of you who know step functions know that this exists, that is now this is supported, but it, didn't, it wasn't supported before. Fargate and ECS. Fargate is a serverless compute, sort of like serverless Docker container. And ECS is a container orchestration. So for each one of our clients, we'll spin up a fleet of Fargate containers, 50 to 300, and we'll use ECS to do that. It's just like, whew, flies. These Fargate containers are going to be those things that do the work, the small rule engines. And the final one is Aurora Serverless V2. It's a relational database. It's a serverless one. And what's interesting about it what was interesting for us about it is that it can auto scale on demand very quickly. It was our long term storage solution. Right, now we know the components. Let's introduce the pattern to distribute the compute. The rule engine uses step functions. The first part of it is to partition the work. Instructions on order how to partition the work are going to be used going to be stored in S3 in temporary storage. Those instructions are then going to be used by the next step to fan out the work using SQS messages. Each one of those messages is going to be that unique operation, the lowest level for us at the moment. We are going to, as well, store them in DynamoDB to track the progress. And then we'll have step functions running there in a loop checking Dynamo to see, is it done? Is it done? And when it's done, it goes to the next part, the one that is the sequential one. So while the step functions are there, something needs to process the messages, right? This is where Fargate containers comes in, the ECS. They are going to be doing all of the work, taking one message at a time, and just comp doing computation. There are, in the meantime, they're going to be updating something in the um, S3, they're going to also be updating Dynamo. OK, so depending on the size of the client, we'll have either 50 or three to 300 containers at the same time. We are using just a fraction of the size, the number of containers we can use. The soft limit from AWS is 1,000 containers, which means we could go up 
2,000, 3,000, why not? The number of containers will actually be decided based on the number of portfolios that client has, because that's that unique smallest operation that we have at the moment, which means if a client has more, there will be more of those unique operations. And because all of this is running in client's AWS account, their isolated one, which means we can comfortably be running 80,000 Fargate containers at the same time without impacting clients. Pretty cool. OK, so the size matters as well, the size of the containers. We know that the portfolio is the smallest unit of work, and we also know that those portfolios can have millions of positions in them. So for some of our complex clients, the sizes of con containers can even go up to 60 gigabytes. Imagine 300 containers, each one of them 60 gigabytes, doing the work and just kind of chucking along. OK, so what did we solve? Which problems are we solving with this? Computational bottlenecks on memory and CPU, as these are now isolated in each client's environment, there is no more noisy neighboring. And now, when a client sends a position file, when they want to do a run, we spin up a fleet of Fargate containers. When we are done, we spin them down, which means we are no longer having those over-provisioned instances that are constantly on making this use less energy and be better for the environment. The storage. So we have solved the computational problem, the distribution of computation. And now we have the storage. Storage is also shared. And the bottlenecks there were on CPU at the peak times of usage when the engine was writing to the database. Another problem we had was rising storage. We started having backup issues. Remember those 10 AM and things are on fire? Yeah. So the biggest part, the largest part of the data that was stored in these SQL databases was actually not the result data. It was that enriched position data, all of those properties attached to it. And this was compressed data. It didn't really make sense to store it in a SQL server, right? We didn't have any benefits of querying capabilities, anything that relational database offer. To give you an example why this was a problem as well is for one of our clients, their complete database was 21 terabytes. And this process data, these JSON blobs, were 19 terabytes of it. Imagine when we found that out. The tool for the job was S3. It's Amazon's file storage, and it's a cheap one. Um, it doesn't have, it has limiting querying capabilities, but combined with S3 Select, it was just enough. I mean, we didn't have anything with SQL, so we got even more. In if you think about it, yeah, we didn't have anything relational based up database, so anything that S3 Select was offering was a benefit. By moving this large chunk of data outside SQL database where it didn't fit, we reduced the pressure of the, on the SQL server. We reduced those maintenance issues we had with backups, and our storage was not growing as rapidly anymore. Basically, we lower the maintenance costs. So I'm doing that developer's mistake that I'm talking about all of these AWS components, buzzwords, you know, this pattern, that pattern architecture. But the real question, the only thing that it matters is, does it work? Did it make any difference? And it did. This architecture massively helped our clients. Let me give you an example. This is an email from the largest Canadian bank, our client. Let me read it. Hey, 
Today, XML file uploading process completed in 39 minutes. It usually takes around one hour and 40 minutes to complete. Could you please confirm this is due to the architecture upgrade that was done last night and that there is no issues with today's processing? <laughs> Woo! Right? Deserves one. <laughs> I mean, it's funny, like, what would you think when you get an email like that? I would start panicking inside. Like, I would go and check, like, did we process all of the portfolios? Did we miss any roles? I mean, we haven't. We tested as well. And now we were proud of what we have done. This saved one hour of our clients' time. The time they, they could be doing something else, like making sure that they're disclosing what they should be, maybe fixing any data issues on their side and rerunning the file if there was a problem. They could be delivering value to their clients, which could be potentially you. Right, nice. So with these two patterns, uh, distributing the computation, and moving this large chunk of data from SQL to S3, we could move 90% of our clients to the new architecture. However, we had last 10% that we could not migrate. And these 10% were still too slow on the new architecture. The bottleneck was, again, SQL Server. Let's go back to that beginning. Rule Engine generates a lot of results. Now, when we have distributed the compute, we have all of these results generated from these containers. And sometimes that's a very high number of results. Have you ever tried storing 20 million of results from 300 containers to the SQL Server at the same time? Do you want to guess what happened? We crashed the SQL cluster. We caused a massive incident. I mean, it was fun, don't get me wrong, but uh, <laughs> it's not something we could do day after day. To work around that, what we have done is we stored all of these results after computation into S3. When they were done, we would grab them from S3 from a single container and slow feed them into SQL Server. But this was just too slow. This was just too slow for these 10% of clients. Like for some of them, this was taking an hour, like 50% of their full runtime. To be able to migrate these last 10% of our clients, the solution for it was to use Amazon's newest release, which was released 17 months ago. So released in April 2022, we used Aurora Serverless V2. It's serverless relational database that is able to scale up very rapidly in very short amount of time, allowing these big bursts of write from 300 containers. It can take it. And then what made it actually cost effective is that it can scale down very fast, which means we manage to isolate each of our clients' databases into their own accounts and get rid of those big Windows machines that were costing, that were serving them, and that over-provisioned SQL Server that needs to be over-provisioned constantly, and not just for that one hour when a client was running a file. This brings us to the end of the journey, not the talk the journey, we need to rebuild the, the engine. Optimizing the old engine, it just didn't make sense. And this new architecture enabled us, the evolving architecture enabled us to evolve with our clients, to support their growth, to support their workloads, and to support our business growth. What are the benefits? We have more stable rule engine. We don't have over-provisioned instances of Windows that are now we have noisy neighboring. No. The client runtimes are more stable. They're more predictable. And we have fewer incidents. 
And file run times are faster. For some of our complex clients, you have seen the email from the Canadian bank. And it's cheaper. First of all, maintenance costs. We don't need to do any more server patching and the weekend work. Like even with the number of incidents, we don't need to do firefighting as much. But also what is more visible and what is easier to track is our AWS bill. This is a graph from April when we still had all of that infrastructure on. The blue part and the red one, so the lower two, are more labeled as EC2. This are, these are the Windows boxes that were hosting our compute, so our engines, and a SQL Server. On the top, those small ones, FSx and S3, those are our backups. Can you notice where the weekend is? No. So it's always the same, no matter if clients are using it or not. Let's compare this to this. This is September. Last month? Yeah, last month. The, on blue, you can see ECS. That's our compute. That's our engine. S3, Aurora Serverless V2, and DynamoDB are the rest. You can actually notice where the weekend is. With the new architecture, we enabled our business growth and our clients' growth. But there is more. We have made the rule engine better for the environment. And this is what we are going to be talking about in the last part. Ready? Sustainability is talked a lot nowadays. And when we talk about it, we talk about economical, social, and environmental. It's time for a confession. Environmental impact is not the main reason why we re-architected the platform. And how we made the rule engine greener at early stages was somehow accidental. The urgency for change came from a business risk. We remember, like, if we didn't make this change, it will be very hard to support and very expensive to support any larger clients and any more complex client. And we were worried we were not able to support them, which would be commercially dangerous. And if we were not profitable as Bootstrap, now scale up, we would not be here as a business and we would not be able to make any positive impact. However, it is very important to us, and as one of the first UK Tech B Corps, the need to reduce our carbon emissions, to think about the negative impact, the negative footprint, and to think about the planet we are leaving behind. This impacts our infrastructure and architecture decisions. The best we can do for the world the best anyone can really do for the world and the planet is to not run any software. <laughs> but that would not be economically sustainable, and why would we be here? So we need to accept that every engine run will equal to energy cost and thus to environmental impact. So what are we doing to reduce that negative impact on the environment? Other than to be able to scale up and support bigger workloads, one of our main goals was to reduce the cost and remain profitable. To reduce the cost, we have eliminated compute infrastructure waste by running the platform only when needed. We got rid of, of those Windows boxes that were always on, that were over-provisioned. By doing that, by reducing the cost, and by using only when we need it, we also reduce the electricity, which is often factored in into the cost of running a service. Electricity usage is a good, not perfect, but good proxy to carbon footprint and a negative impact to the environment. To know if we are making any difference with the changes we are making and in which direction, we need to have some data. So we added some metrics, we added some tags. 
I will not mention observability here, it doesn't play a role. Um, <laughs> but with this, we knew which options we have, and we were choosing the ones that were bringing the most value. And in some cases, that meant improving performance, not just by adding more nodes and using more electricity power, but by making the code more performant, by making the rule engine work smarter instead of harder. Majority of the changes that we have done recently to optimize the performance can fit into two categories. The first one is what worked well for the rule engine for a smaller client, for a simpler client, does not necessarily work well for a more complex client. And this is not as easy to find as you might think. When you onboard a more complex client, you expect their runtime to go up. But what was proven to us more than once, it doesn't need to go linearly up with complexity. The runtime will go up, but it might be more flat than you might think. And finding these places is gold. Let me give you an example. It can be as simple as removing to shrink, done tens of millions of times. To shrink that is not used anymore, that is there to support a legacy feature that is not used by anyone anymore. Making that change saved us enough time that I'm embarrassed to say how much. And you can ask me after the talk. <laughs> so let's move to the next category. What worked well for the rule engine in a single process does not necessarily work for the rule engine that is distributed. While rewriting the engine by changing the architecture, we reused a lot of business logic code. By reusing the business logic code, we missed some important things in a number of places. And this is mostly due to accessing the data. So you know how easy it is in memory. I can get any object I want with all of the properties. I don't need to think about anything. But that's not the case in the distributed engine. So the solution for that one is grab only what you need. And what you're using often, cache it. Of course, there is a secret ingredient. Those are those peppers from last night's talk. <laughs> um, and it's the secret ingredient that makes all of this possible, that impacts every part of this. It's the culture, it's the people. We care, we talk about it, we include it in our architecture reviews. And we try to make it easier for other people to do a good thing, for other developers in our team to do a good thing. All of this is how we write our software, how we develop it, and it's how we got to greener role engine. That's how we develop our software, how we write it. But where we run it also plays a role. The cloud provider. We chose AWS. As you know, AWS is one of the largest cloud computing services providers. And they know how important sustainability is to their clients, which makes them care about sustainability too, right? To keep them in the game. They provide tools to measure carbon footprint that helps us with the data. We get more detailed data. They provide, they share other clients' stories so we can learn from them. And they came up with a framework on how to get to a well-architected system that we can use when developing our platform. They will try their best to reduce their carbon emissions. And what they can't reduce, well, parts of it, they'll offset in some way. And let's face it, there are carbon emissions and carbon footprint. It's not small. But because it's a core of part of their business, right? They are cloud services provider. We make them do better and be better, do more, not just because we are good people. I mean, we are. But it's also because all of the carbon emissions that are left in the air are then left for us as a business to offset. And as I mentioned, like, 
it's really hard to impossible to reduce our carbon emissions to zero. We are like AWS in a software development industry. And our carbon emissions don't come just from running a platform. That's actually a very tiny part. They come from traveling, from visiting our clients, from me being at this conference, from commuting to the office, from having an office. I will not go into offsetting into too many details to not make this talk even longer. But I would like to underline all of this with as a company, we have committed to be carbon neutral by 2077. Woo! This is one of those more. <laughs> we didn't need to do it, and not a lot of companies are doing it, but we still feel strongly about it, and we got courage, and we committed to it. What's next for us? Whoa, um, endless possibilities. Where we are now is far away from perfect, and far away from being done. We'll keep learning, and we'll keep getting better data, more detailed data. So we can make those informed decisions, so we can have more options. So we can go through that framework and iterate over it. We can make that call more performant, find more of those hidden spots. And we can re-architect smaller parts of the rule engine to be more greener. We're also working on delivering more value to our clients by using the data that we already calculated using that existing calculated data. And maybe those clients, our clients, are getting this value from their internal systems or from different vendors. But we already have the data. Why not reuse it? Add more rules, add more jurisdictions, give them more value so they have fewer providers. And then we can push it. For the non-time sensitive operations, run it when electricity grid is not overloaded. Or let's use greener region or data center. Or let's shift it left. Educate the clients to use the platform in a greener way. Why not running one file instead of multiple if their business allows it? What can you do? Obviously, please don't wait for your business to be in danger to do something. Please don't. This was our story. And, you know, Big Bang, it made a great talk, lucky me. But, you know, steady progress and small steps maybe don't make it a sexy talk, but they can be as efficient, even more efficient, and they can make a brilliant and inspiring story if you want to share it. So get the data, see where you are, make your next steps informed, talk about it, to your colleagues, your friends, your family, to people at this conference. Don't think it's all or nothing. Perfection is a killer. No solution is perfect, and you know, nobody is perfect. And everyone can play a role. Make it easier for others to make a change. Make it easier for others to follow you, to do something. But also make it easier, cheaper, and faster to experiment, to fail, and then to learn from it. You know what? This is not fine. Like, our planet is screwed. And every other company out there is a software company. I learned on Wednesday that 20 to 25% of electricity usage is used by digital sector. That's above aviation, like, you know, the planes that use a lot of fuel. And I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, but this is us. And as software engineers, we do have a big role to play. We are in early stages, and we need to change a gear. Do you really want to be the one that is speeding this up and making it worse? And then, if you really don't care about the planet, how about this? This skill of writing software that doesn't impact environment in such a bad way, that is low consumption, your boss is going to ask you to do that. The government will. 
and tomorrow in an interview, this is what's going to decide if you're going to get a job or not. Either way, get better at this. I'm going to leave you with the last one. Um, something that my CEO recently reminded me of. Every dollar you choose to spend is a vote for the future you want to live in. Choose it wisely. Thank you. Questions welcome, or I'll be here a bit afterwards so you can ask me.